watching Feminine Wealth TV, the show that uncovers the diamond tips on creating truly conscious wealth from change makers, world shakers, and wealth creators. Today, I'm joined on the show by Fiona Cosgrove of Wellness Coaching Australia. And Fiona, she truly is another change maker that has joined this show. So Fiona has 25 years experience in health, fitness, and the wellness industries. From owning and managing health clubs all over Australia and Asia, health clubs like the Golden Door Group of Health Retreats. And she's also lectured on corporate health management in universities and is creating a new model for change in the wellness industry with her newest business, Wellness Coaching Australia. Fiona is passionate about helping people and organizations be the best they can be by recognizing that optimum, optimal ment mental health, physical and emotional wellness are essential for growth of the individual and within the corporate culture. Fiona, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. So look, as always, I like to start the show with how I met my guests and the reasons for having them on the show. So Fiona and I met uh, last year, I think it was about a year ago now. That we met. Yeah, we'll be yeah. We met last year both speaking at an event here in Sydney. Uh, and I think we probably hit it off because both of us being from Northern Hemisphere and living in the sunnier Southern Hemisphere of Australia, we probably uh, initially had that, that uh, connection. <laughs> connection. So um, Fiona and I were having a really good conversation at the event last year about the con connection between wellness and wealth and actually having you know, financial consciousness um, and the impact that has on the world and our, on our own health. So I thought it would be really interesting to delve into just how much our finances and feelings about money affect our wellness. And similarly, how much our health and wellness affects our ability to actually make money and do well in the wealth space. So Fiona, to kick things off, I just wanted to really start with you know, this concept of wellness. What is it really? It's a big word. It is a big word. I think you get frightened by this big yeah, you word. You see it everywhere. They say actually wellness is a trillion dollar industry these days. Oh, wow, yeah. And yeah, it's a really difficult one to define, or at least I think to get the general impression to the public that what are we talking about. Obviously, it's something good. Yes. It's something we all want. Yes. Um, to me, I had to have a definition because people ask me, what, what do you do? What do you mean? What's wellness coaching? So coaching is one thing and wellness is something else. And wellness to me is best described, I suppose, as optimal mental and physical health right. and I could even take that further because I had to go to the dictionary to define optimal because the question came up is it the best someone can possibly be according to the guidelines and the, the books you know like right. how fit can you be how thin should you be etc yeah. whereas if you if you really look at it optimal is a subjective description so it's about being the best you choose to be. Not oh, I like that. The best you, best you choose to be. So yeah. finally, we can sort of let go of all these shoulds yeah. that we yeah. have hanging around. And I guess with wealth, maybe that's the same thing. It's down to yeah. there'll probably be a lot of um, people out there who feel that to have money, to have more money is better than, you know, the more you can get, the more you... Yeah, how much should, should you have, have it? Yeah. before you're wealthy? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's very, very similar. Yeah. I think they're quite similar concepts, and it's yeah. an interesting... Um, combination, I think, that you brought together today, so I'm happy to bridge out that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the reason people struggle so much with kind of getting well or being at optimal wellness is because there are so many facets involved in wellness? You know, there's yeah. your fitness, there's your mental health, your emotional health, health and obviously I'm bringing in financial health. Mm. But are there other, what are the other areas that, that you touch on in your coaching? Yeah, again, it's a really big, big topic because I come from a health background, health mm. and fitness background, and I used to think it was all about having you know, the best physical fitness you can have and, and hopefully a, a decent body composition and feeling good about yourself. Whereas if you start looking at mental health and you start reading the, the literature and the research from people like um, Dr. Martin Seligman, his definition of, it used to be happiness, but it's interesting that he now calls it well-being. Oh, he's five things. He's moving with the trend. Exactly, <laughs> yes. I think so. And nutrition has yeah. been brought into it, but it used to be, um, oh, he's described recently as positive emotions engagement in life, positive relationships, meaning and achievement. Mm -hmm. And when I use those five things, I always add another P, so I call it PERMAP, and add physical health. Of course, because it is important, them. yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in, in well-being. Mm -hmm. Why did they leave physical health out? Well, I think it was all about from here up, so it's all about mental health, whereas the fitness industry and the health industries yeah. are all about physical health, and yet to me they're completely intertwined. And your introduction today I found again really interesting because often people think that someone who works in the wellness industry, the last thing on their mind is 
building wealth or even acknowledging that wealth has importance because in the definition I just gave you there there was nothing about the dollar sign yeah it was achievement yeah and that probably is the clue I think to where really money might fit in so Fiona like your whole career really from from the beginning has been about health and fitness and wellness this this journey that you've been on can you tell us where did it all begin yeah where did it all begin? I don't know which part of my life I was in, which career I was in when I started with health and fitness. I suppose I'd always had a passion for it. If you tend to have any ability at sports, you become interested in your, I guess, your physical identity. Mm-hmm. So I think part of when you grow up and you, if you, you play sports well, that's part of how you get your self-esteem. And then you gravitate to what you're good at as well. Yeah. You think. It took a few you know, turns yeah. to, yeah. in other directions, but finally I realised that I was interested in working in that area. Um, without boring you about all the different jobs that took me there, I ended up in the fitness industry and really, really feeling that I was aligned with you know, the things that I cared about, which was you feel good when you're fit. Mm. Um, and again, in my 20s, I was very much around, you know, go after the next, the next goal, the next physical goal, whether it's running a marathon or whatever. Mm. And wanting to, everybody to do the same. And of course, now at, a, at an older age, I realised that that probably was useful for about 10% of the people we were dealing with, our clientele. Yeah. But it, it's what the fitness industry, it's changing, but it was about in those days. It was about like the body. Like, yeah, the body yeah, and, like her and, and having a good time and, and mm. a lot of things that probably gave a bit of a bad name back in the 80s. Yeah. But yeah, I um, where it all began. So from there, it sort of evolved and I went from being an educator. I usually say if I brought my two parts of my life together, I went from fitness to wellness and from expert to coach. Right, okay. But to do those things have been a lot of, I guess, business decisions made and mm. I haven't been able to do any of those things or wouldn't have been able to do any of those things if the money side of things wasn't considered. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's what I think a lot of business owners forget is that it is a really important part of, of your journey. You know, it, it comes on the journey with you, really, is, is the money yeah, issue. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, over, over your career, were there are times, and I'm sure there has been because you're human and we're all human, mm. when you let your own wellness at fault, yeah. you know, stress, overwhelm, etc. Yeah. I mean, you know, what, what were those times in your life? I suppose, yeah. again, now having a, a better understanding of what wellness is or what it means to me, not so much what it is, what it means mm. to me. I probably had times in my life where I thought I was on fire. Yeah. <laughs> I was striving for whatever it happened to be at the time. So whether it was studying and it was getting a degree or a distinction or whatever you kind of go for and you're a little bit of a mm. high achiever. Um, potentially, I, I think, well not potentially, possibly some of those goals might have been other people's goals that I thought it was important. More shoulds. To, yeah, <laughs> I, I should do this because it's expected of me and therefore so and so will think you know, whether mm-hmm. it's mother, father or whoever, I yeah. think that I've, I've achieved things. So I look back at one time where, well, probably a few times, where I had young children, I was studying a degree, I think I was lecturing, and I was running a business. You were basically being superwoman. Absolutely. How many of us are doing that? <laughs> <laughs> we're all doing that. I, look back, I don't think they even knew my name in those days. So I was yeah. breastfeeding in the middle of it too at one stage. But I, I let go of um, the sense of how I was feeling. And I, I think for a few years there, I actually really kind of, not totally lost touch, but I was on such a treadmill to yeah, get to the next, just, to just hit the, the next, next goal. Yeah, yeah. that I, I didn't really stop and go, are you happy? Mm. But, because you know, actually, interestingly, goal setting obviously is something that a lot of coaches would talk about. Yeah. You know, the, the power of goal setting, the importance of goal setting. But do you think that sometimes we can get lost in that and that goal setting can become something like a, a job in itself that actually can make you unhappy and not happy? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, we talk in wellness coaching as goals as being the steps along the way to arrive at the place that we describe as being your vision of, of improved wellness. So goals are more about targets or their steps, their action steps, so mm. if you achieve that goal rather than the big goal. I think a lot of people think that when they get whatever it is they want, that if when mentality. Yeah, that then I'll, be... I'll stop. Then I'll be happy. Then. Yeah. And it's the old cliche of mm. it's not the destination, but it's the journey that usually gives us the most satisfaction. Yeah. So we prefer to think of goals as being very necessary steps along the way to usually creating new habits, mm. which is really what behaviour change and wellness is all about. And getting you to put where you actually. But do you think people yeah. struggle with? Because I think one of the things that um, you know I always say is that. 
with money, you know, obviously that's my topic, is that money money really is just a tool to be used by you. Yeah. It's at your service there to help you go where, where, wherever it is that you want to go. Yeah. But I think most people get struggle with the where is it that I want to go yeah. and where yeah. is it that I should go versus yeah. what I want. And I don't think they, people understand the difference between those two things. Is yeah. that something you find in your... I think definitely. I think there's a really good parallel there that money to me is a means to an end. Mm. But there really isn't an end because we're in it for life, you know. We're, we're not going to just yeah. get there and get the Ferrari or whatever it is whereas there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with having an end goal that might be represented by something that money can buy mm. I think it's down to really what does that represent is it about well, let's use Ferrari just as an example yeah, because it's, it's a good example thing, yeah. <laughs> and it represents a, a certain degree of status okay yeah. it also represents a certain degree of look what I've done it also could represent, I love cars and I just want to sit in a Ferrari and own a Ferrari and, and drive a Ferrari. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that any of those are wrong and any of those are right, but I think it's very, very individual. Yeah. And I mean, we could really sort of tie ourselves in knots of this whole topic of, you know, what, what does money actually do for... I, I look at it and say, a lack of money is a yeah. problem. I think really the base yeah. level, if you haven't got it, you really can't go after life, but I don't think having money necessarily gives, gives you happiness what you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, speaking of having no money, right, mm. you know, I mean, I remember being in, in a, a few years back, you know, being in a state of financial strain myself. Yeah. I think we've, we've all been there, you know, we've all had times when we've done things that probably led us to financial strain. Mm. And, you know, I'm someone who's very interested in the wellness industry. I yeah. eat really well, I exercise, I get all that. I'm, I'm big into personal development and all that stuff. But I have to say, getting my financial life in order did more for me than any yoga practice or yeah. green juice ever could have at that mm -hmm. time. And actually just getting my act together and just solving some of the debt problems I had and some of the bad yeah. financial management practices that I had. And actually just, it, it lifted my energy. Yeah. And I suppose now this is why I feel quite passionately that yeah. that, that financial education or financial responsibility is actually a factor in wellness as well. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with you entirely. And I think, you know, it's again, it's that flip side of it. It's not so much that having money gives you energy because really when you said to me, what's wellness about? Mm. The currency of wellness to me is energy. Yeah, but at the end of the day, that's what everybody wants, wants yeah. really, isn't well, it? We all want more energy. Vitality, yeah. all yeah. that stuff, all the losing weight and all those things are fine. They're just ways of getting more energy. Mm. But it, I think financial strain and financial burden is an energy drain. So yeah. it's not so much that you'll get energy from having more money, it's yeah. just that if you are under that strain or you're not in control and you don't know where you're going, you don't know what's going to happen next, mm. it can deplete, I think, the goodness of your life or the happiness in your life. Yeah. So I, I feel I, I'm with you and I think it's absolutely essential for everyone to have a degree of control because one of the biggest drivers in life is to have control. Yeah. And if we don't know what's going on with our financial situation, we haven't got control of that area. We don't have control yeah, of that. I mean, not that to say that you can never really have full control of your life. I mean, there's, you know, no. there's, there's, you know, this flow and you've got to yeah. let go of some things. Yeah. But I think in, in your financial life, it's certainly a strain that you can take away. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I suppose education would be a bit like what you're doing in wellness. I mean, do you think education is the, is the key in some of these things to... Do you mean specifically with regard to... Well, I suppose when you think about clients. wellness, like when you yeah. when you're coaching clients, yeah. is it when they get a bit more um, in the know about what they need to be doing in order yeah. to feel better? Yeah, it's it's the power of coaching, I guess, yeah. and mentoring. It's funny because there is one side of it where people are thirsty for knowledge, and that's the way. Again, I say the fitness industry, health and fitness, and, and, and the government. Everyone is all about if yeah. we just tell people the answer they'll be fine. The reality is people don't because they actually want to come up with the answer themselves and that's what coaching is about yes, yes. because we are autonomous, self-determining creatures who like mm. our own ideas better than other people's. Mm. So in terms of, you know, do people just need to know, does, is that more empowering? I think it is empowering education. But the kind of real empowerment that people get is when the light bulb goes on in their head, mm. usually around self-awareness, mm. which I think is more significant often than oh my goodness, that's I have to do it because she did it, he did it, they told oh, me. Oh yeah, yeah, it's that, it is that self-knowledge and like self-awareness, yeah. And self-awareness, yeah. I mean, you know, with your own, I mean, you've run, you know, you've run mega businesses, you know, you've made a lot of money in your time, you know, you've been very, very successful. I know that you've also lost money in your time, as you know, like that's yeah. the, the nature of business. Do you feel that throughout running, you know, at the height of things in your businesses, that, that if you had had more guidance or mentoring on the financial end of things, do you think it would have been less stressful? 
I think, how do you feel about that? I think it would have been, it's very, it's very individual, isn't it? I mm. think that if I didn't have some knowledge, which I did have, yeah. it could have been absolutely terrifying. Mm. So I kind of knew enough to stay above the real stress line. Yeah. But I could imagine if you didn't have that, it could be really, really you yeah. know, not good for you at all. And yet I look back now and think what I knew later would have helped me enormously. Mm. in the early days. I think it's funny, everyone's relationship with money is very different, isn't it? Yes. I think that's really what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, because people feel differently about it. And some people are ostrich head in the sand, they just don't want to look at it, yeah. which is yeah. it's so unhealthy in, the, in, in, in its yeah. own way. And then other people are just gung-ho after that and that alone, which is yeah. also just as unhealthy. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean that you have a good relationship with money if that's all you're after, because really, you know, the pursuit of money with no greater purpose is, is sort yeah. of the, the journey into the vortex of emptiness, which was something I came up with the other day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other thing I wanted to touch on, you know, often we talk about financial strain, but mm -hmm. often having a lot of money and having, uh, you know, being, being wealthy, but having a lot of big decisions to make that you don't feel confident making. Yeah. You know, how stressful do you think that is? You've, you've been in that yeah. situation. Uh, if you want to share Gosh, some of the, so much research, you've been in a lot of those situations. Yeah, yeah, lots of research written on that for people who win the lotto. A lot of it is yeah. to do with whether or not you feel you deserve the money. So if you suddenly get a windfall, and, and people, you hear yeah. this all the time, if you actually don't believe you deserve that, you'll get rid of it. You'll get rid of it very yeah. quickly. And you can yeah. make yourself Same like divorces as well, the same thing happens yeah. in divorces. Yeah. So if you suddenly make money, I know in my case, we had a couple of really, I mean, I, I look back at my career and go, I think I did a lot of good work and I've been, mm. been, you know, did, made some good choices and decisions, but I've been very lucky too. There's always been a luck involved. Yeah, and you've got to be grateful for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I think about selling businesses, I didn't start businesses up with my, my partner then and then yeah. on my own to sell them. And I'll look back and go, well, why not? Why not? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, a lot of people do that. Well, a lot of people, as is, we were talking off, off, off camera earlier, you were saying a lot of people, particularly women, are building jobs and yeah, not actual businesses. Really something to do because it's not, you know, because yeah. they're, and often if it's a business we're passionate about, we're so involved in it that we can't separate ourselves yeah. from it. And we never see it as an asset that could be sold one day. That's right. Yeah. But it's, it's, you know, we, we were talking about things can change, you know, yeah. so life, life can throw different things yeah. at you when you may need to sell yeah. a company one day. Yeah, so if you do, getting back to that idea of, mm. I think about the experience of selling the first business, I think, again, you can, and, and I, whether it's a male or female thing, I don't know. For me, mm. it was great. We got we sold a business, we had yeah. more money than we ever imagined we would. I kind of went, yeah, great, put it over there, now let's go on with life, let's go and do yeah. fun things that money can buy and have a bit of time now. Whereas um, my partner at the time, and again, I, it was very identified with the business and the mm. job and his purpose in life, whereas I had two young kids. That was all. Oh, yeah. So he, his sense of identity was taken away, just even though he had a lot of money. He yeah. had sold the business, which was selling. And he said business. himself that he really kind of struggled with that. So it's very yeah. quickly we went back into another business. So I think there is a difference in, in male and women, and it depends on the, I guess, yeah. the, the nature of the business. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first experience. And then I think the second one, when again, was not, not certainly didn't set out to. Um, take the business over on my own with the view of increasing my wealth or doubling or trebling, whatever it was. Mm. And it just happened to be the right time and the right place. I'm glad I had the knowledge to know that always take a sale if a good sale comes along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, never mind. Well, you're not. This is my baby. This is my plan. Yeah. This is, you can't have yeah. it. Because what could have happened in that case if I hadn't gone through the tremendously stressful time of due diligence and selling it and renegotiating it and lease and everything, about two years later, GFC hit. I wouldn't oh, have had business to sell. Yeah. yeah. You would just would not have had business to sell. Yes. It would have just, you know. I mean, I mean speak, speaking of that, you know, it's a very emotional decision if somebody comes mm. to you and wants to buy your business. Yeah. How, what, I mean, what advice would you give to some, somebody who's facing that or maybe might face that in the future about how, how, to, how to keep your wellness intact yeah. when you're dealing with the, a large financial decision like yeah. that that may overwhelm you? I think, it's, I think so much of this comes back to what I really believe in the wellness coaching model that we use, which is really not necessarily, as I say, helping people get fit or thin or whatever. Yeah. It's about living a good life, living a life that's got life satisfaction. A lot of that comes and from fulfillment. Energy, fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. So if when you write a, we call it a vision statement, mm -hmm. the way you'd like things to really kind of develop, not, not necessarily the thing that you haven't got the holy grail, but yeah. this is the way I'd like my life to be. And it might be mainly like that, but you might like to make improvements in certain areas. Mm -hmm. So you might talk about what you want more of. I think it becomes fairly clear as to what's most important for you. Mm -hmm. And again, it's almost like this money is a means to an end. So if someone said, well, am I going to take the money and run? 
Mm. Why are they going to stay in a business that I love and have so much meaning? Which again, there was well, that's that's that. Right. I write that, right. that as a consideration. So then, I guess the, 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 what you have to look at then is what will the money enable me to do, and what risk do I take by not? It, it, it's yeah. part of life, isn't it? It's currency of life, energy and money, mm-hmm. and currencies of currencies life. of life. Yeah, and if, if you really need to do something passionately, well, then you've got to ask yourself the question: Can I do that again in another way? Yeah, and because that is my vision, and the, the vision that you've been on for so long has been this business or this idea or this giving back, and now somebody comes wanting to buy it. Yeah. And while the check might look great, what's the money without the vision? Or without what's your, the next challenge? What's your next challenge? What's your next challenge? Yeah. So we encourage people to think like that too, and as you said, it's that flexibility. Mm. It's not that this is the way I want my life to look. If mm. something comes out at you at the side, you go, okay, given the new information, mm. what can I do with it? And yeah, if it's, it's finances... Yeah, I mean, there's something I've been talking to some of my clients about is saying that, you know, when when you come to making business decisions, I always try and say to them, it's very important what you said about having your own personal vision first. Yeah. Because whatever business decision or financial decision you make, it must align with what your personal vision is and not the other way around. Because yeah. otherwise you are on the road to unhappiness and, and lack yeah. of clarity. Yeah. So I suppose that would be something yeah. that I try and get people to make decisions based on that. Because it's not about the money or the size of the check or whatever it is that you're going to do. Yeah. It's about what is it going, what impact is going to have on your yeah. personal vision. So we talk about, yeah. when I say about the vision, we actually say, so what's the value behind that? Because that's yeah. another way of actually putting it into sort of um, compartments in a way. It's like, well, this mm. is what I want in my life because this is important to me. And yeah. it might be freedom. It freedom. might be family. Yeah. It might be helping. It might be, you know, whatever, mm. any one of those things, that everyone's going to have very different values. And it's getting clear about actually what what those values are and, you know, what does money, and I ask clients this as well, what does money mean to you personally? Because I can't actually tell somebody, I can teach people all the tools and strategies and tactics about becoming wealthy, Mm. but I can't teach them what view they want when they get to the top of the mountain that they've chosen. You know, that's something that they have to do yeah, for themselves. Really good way of putting it. So, yeah. you know, I always say to people, it's really important to start with that because I can help you get there, but if you get to the wrong place, I can't change it, yeah. you know? I think also a good way of putting it, especially again in the wellness industry where so many people work, and they often say, I'm the luckiest person in the world because mm. I work in an area. And I think, well, they, they are if the rest of their life is working okay. Yeah. But being the luckiest person in the world and not having enough money to pay the bills or the mortgage. Uh, exactly. I don't think it's that lucky. Yeah. So, yeah. Some of the, I mean, particularly in the wellness industry, I would see this. I have a lot of friends who are yoga teachers and stuff like yeah. this. And it's changing a lot now, but you know, what there used to be the catch cry in the industry is, but I'm, you know, I'm not into the money. <laughs> and I just think, oh, really? I mean, you, you know, you can't step outside the door because you don't have any money. Oh, no. And money is, unfortunately, you know, the wheel of life. I think they need to add in a financial element because it is a part of your of your, your well being and, and your life. It does. It does and it's the measure of success for yourself. And that's the, yeah. the, my personal view on me being successful in the businesses I've had and in my current business, which I never set up to be a, a money or yeah, to yeah. sell or anything. But I look now, I'm excited by the financial success of that business now yeah. because it means that what we're doing yeah. is working and we've now got the capability of getting it out there to more people. So yeah. the money for me is not about, I've got this much in the bank or yeah. I'm going to be okay and I can live till I'm 95 or whatever we were saying earlier. Yeah. It's down to now now we matter. Now well, we're now you're saying it. It. People, are, people are willing to pay yes. for the, for the yeah. value that you're giving. Yeah. And yeah. because they're, you're honouring the value exchange, yeah. which is your gift serving, and you're yeah. honouring the value exchange in terms of money coming yeah. back, and that money can then be used to, to serve and, and get more value to more people. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's that yeah. the value exchange is being honoured, and from that you can see that your it's work is being very important. Yeah. And it's also an indication of the fact that people are interested in what we're doing. They so they're not it. alone. Mm-hmm. They need it. They're willing to pay for it. They want it. They're ready for it. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, seven years ago, people said, what's wellness? What's coaching? Yeah. So it, it represents a lot of different things. But there, I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling the nice, nice warmth. Yeah, of knowing that it's it's financial stability. Success. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. I said I think I said earlier that you know you count and you matter, but in today's world in business, it's mm-hmm. important to have a good financial standing. Yes. Otherwise, people don't pay attention. And it's yeah. not about throwing the money around, but no, it's, 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 it's say, yeah, yeah, we're doing okay. That what I do, what I do, what, what we're doing here matters, and that's yeah. it's, it's and we've thought about that. You know, we yeah. don't just think about the product; we think about 
the actual structure of the business mm. and the way we created. Mm. It reminds me of the days where you know the gym industry was flourishing again, early eighties. Talking now, yeah. there was a gym on every corner. They were selling lifetime memberships, and everybody was saying, "Oh, those late warmers!" And, <laughs> and they went broke two weeks later. So they joined oh. the seven hundred members, and then the doors would close. What was that? Oh, that was, that was right. There were many, many chains that did that, and the yeah. fitness industry had the dirtiest reputation of any industry, literally in the eighties. And we were fighting against that, so. People didn't want to know about it because they mm. said, you take our money, you close your door, and that's what's happening because there wasn't a good business model behind it. Yeah. So this it's is personal actually, pride. Yeah, yeah. And this is great because, you know, again, a lot of people I speak to, there's the importance of the business model. Yeah. It's not just about, you know, the passion that you have for, for your message or, or mm. what it is that you do, but the business model matters. Yeah. It really matters. I think I was thinking of an analogy when, when we were talking earlier that I don't really sit around and count, I'm not, I'm not going to count the dollars, and yeah. I, I, I get excited maybe once a month where I look at the bottom line and go, yeah, we did good, that's mm-hmm. fine. I don't stress on the detail every day. To me, I think having a good financial stability is a bit like living at home if my closet was all disorganised and the clothes lying all over. Yeah, and clothes all over the floor. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. to be in order. Yeah, and yeah. someone's taking care of the boring stuff that I don't know and telling yeah. me what I need to know so I can make the decisions that... That I'm needs to good be made. at, yeah. But if it's all over the show, even well, that's when it's yeah. stressful. Because even when your wardrobe is all over the place, that's quite exactly. stressful in your life. It is, and that's <laughs> I feel exactly the same way about both those things. Yeah. Some people are really, really happy yeah. with their wardrobe or whatever they also all over the place, true. all over the place, and they yeah. seem to be able to move forward. Yeah. But I think you know it's we must be very like that because process. for me that could just be <laughs> <laughs> we must be tight A personalities or something. Yeah. <laughs> So it is, it is down to, I think, how, and, and then we also have people with money, too, who have to be absolutely in control of every cent. And, and well, that's a problem, too. That's I know, a right? the money thing. I'm like, well, you know, I just, you know, there's, we, all, we all have different different issues. But look, m- moving on, Sandy, I wanted to touch on your work in the corporate world. So you also work with corporates on, on wellness within the within their company, in the employees. Is that the... It's certainly becoming, it's, it's going to a rapid growth area. So yeah. corporate wellness or corporate health has been around mm. for a while and it, back in the early days when I, I was first actually teaching a subject called corporate health management nobody knew anything about mm. it and I was trying to find someone who was doing something somewhere it would have been talking about it was, woo, actually because oh, having, having just, been in the corporate yeah. world myself I can imagine you know I mean only the big companies would be doing corporate well there's gym yeah uh, basically yeah, gym, or you had a subsidized gym membership and yeah. that was it yeah. or maybe a stop smoking talk once a year or something like yeah. that yeah but um, interesting presenting at the conferences occasionally at the Health and Productivity Conference. Yeah. It, it's been slow growth, and they've gone, they've gone through this phase of going, at the end of the day, we just want to know what the dollar value is to put in spending this much money. Yeah. And that can be quite difficult. Because you can't really measure that. Well, there's three ways of measuring it. That yeah. the, the, what they do is absenteeism, presenteeism, oh, yes, right, okay. and turnover of staff. And the last one, actually, is only just starting to be noticed that employers who offer good structured corporate health benefits or programs mm. it's not just that but it's actually showing it, it shows that they care mm. and they become an employer of choice so people, people start gravitating to, to those companies yeah. because of the culture within the company mm. Mm. but in terms of the types of programs that are being um, offered now we're seeing a lot of last resort or what from the phrases where there's say the mines or there's those oh, industries yeah. where people are really are burning out yeah. or suffering from you know big work station claims yeah. rehab everything and they're going we've got to fix these people or they're well because ways. there's a shortage of more people coming exactly. so they have a and it's a shortage. Them a fortune yeah. when people can't work so it's all about getting them back to work it's a bit like after the horse has bolted but at least it's a start and now they're starting to realize that say coaching in other words helping people with behavior change is a good thing, but again, they're focusing very much on the people who need to fix their lives. Mm. Whereas in an ideal world, to make well, get, them coach, yeah. get them before, yeah, yeah, yeah. preventative measures actually help people make choices mm. in their daily routine, which is very boring because it's all made up of habits, mm. but that support their energy levels because they've got better energy levels, they're going to be better employees. Yeah, because recently we've been reading quite a lot about this whole triple bottom line. Um, accounting, which is sort of saying that you know, for companies now that you know the focus is not only just on profit but on people and planet, and I guess you know where you're really dealing with is this this people end and actually getting the most out of your human capital, yeah, which is part of a company. So you know, anyone running a big company out there, you know, it is really important the wellness of your employees and actually the happiness of them. And it, that comes of actually just written some for a level three training on on, on happiness and mm. talking about whether it's 
well, all wellness, whether it's we should be focusing on the individual or collectively. And there is a lot written now, even in countries. So we know that you know, Bhutan has been the only country that's measured um, gross national wellness. Um, sorry, gross domestic oh. happiness. I forget oh, really? In, yeah. in where? They actually have a measure of it. Uh -huh. And a lot of the countries, even in England, now have got seven sort of tenets of wellness yeah. of how they judge the well-being of the country. So that, you know, the old. So it's really coming yeah, to the changing from the how rich are we. Mm, to how well are we and how happy are we. Yeah. But that's exciting. That's really exciting. That is really exciting because I mean I, I sort of feel as well if we can get away from because money has such a bad rap. You know, like you and I have talked about this. It has such a bad rap and it, it upsets me because money really is a neutral thing. It's nothing. It it takes on the values that we give it. Yeah. So if, if it ha if it has an ugliness attached to it, it's not because it is inherently ugly, it's the people who have it, it and what we're doing yeah. with it that is ugly. Yeah. So I do, I think this whole movement of consciousness globally in, in lots of different spaces is, is, is fabulous in yeah. wellness and in hopefully in wealth. I'm trying to push it through in the wealth space as yeah. well. Even in leadership, you know, like in Definitely. conscious yeah. leadership and yeah. conscious capitalism, all these different things. There's a lot of interesting stuff written on, uh, I notice here, that, that book, one of my favourite books here, The Happiness oh, Project, Happiness Project. Project. Great chapter on money, which I'm sure you're familiar yes. with. But, um, it was saying how there's lots of different classifications as to how does, it, does money buy happiness. And she makes a really good point that money doesn't buy happiness, neither does good health. Health doesn't buy no, happiness. No, it doesn't. It's almost like you need to have yeah. both in order to be able to live a good life and have purpose and meaning yeah. in what you do. Well, it's like this whole thing where we started the conversation. Wellness, yeah. the facets, there's so many facets of wellness, like that you almost yeah. see that it, all these different areas working in the same way to achieve Absolutely. true wellness. And wellness is your own definition. That's really struck me where it's the relativity of wealth. So they looked at the research, or she looked at the research and said, you know, basically, if you were fairly wealthy, or the, the, mm. the people who earned over a certain amount of money were, were happier than people who earned less. Yes. But one of the points she made was that happiness and financial, the relationship between finances and happiness was also relativity. So oh. in other words, if you had four cows and your neighbour had three... Oh yeah, you were on. You'd be pretty happy. You'd be pretty happy <laughs> until the next neighbour has six. <laughs> there is in today's society, and the thing is, it's human nature. Yeah. It's human nature, isn't it? Say whether you drive. We want to be top. I suppose it's that whole survival of the fittest thing. We want to be top dog. And it's it's, it's almost a sad reflection on human nature in a way. But it's yeah. interesting to bear that in mind. So, what we're doing is saying that really wealth represents that yeah. we're doing something better than other people. Than other people, which makes us feel successful. Is yeah. that achievement part of the wellness sort of thing that you were talking about, having that achievement? And I find it quite sad in a way too, because yeah. you know, there are a lot of wealthy people who don't really judge themselves on their money, and there's a lot of people out there who their money defines them, yeah. and they expect other, the privilege of wealth. You know, they mm. expect to have privilege because of... Yeah, because of who they are, what they own. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Mm. So, Fiona, as a savvy femtrepreneur doing amazing things in business, what does the future hold for Fiona Cosgrove? Well, at the very grand age of I shouldn't disclose it, <laughs> should I? I'm at the stage now where I thought I would be nicely retired. Yes. I tried that a few You years tried ago. that, though. But you didn't like it. <laughs> it's very boring. Um, I don't think retirement sort of features in my long-term plan. But it's certainly right now it's a, a, a nice place to be to go all... Now let me revisit the things that I maybe haven't had time to do. Yeah. So the travel and the freedom and the exploration and the unfulfilled goals of writing. Yeah. and So really analysing my life to say, am I fitting in the things that are really that important, important to me that aren't just about building an empire or building a business? Yeah. And, and I'm really pleased to say that I feel financially, if I wasn't in a position mm -hmm. that I'm in now, in other words, if we were still striving and struggling and trying to get things you know, across mm -hmm. the line... Um, I wouldn't be able to do that, and now I can do that, and it's a great place to be because really at the end of the day, we all know yeah. when you drop dead, it's not what your bank balance is, it's no. probably what legacy you'd leave, mm -hmm. or how much fun you'd have, or what people said of you, know, say oh, about it's your you. epitaph really, isn't well, it? Yeah, yeah, what yeah, people exactly. say about you at your yeah. funeral kind of thing. And I'd rather people remember me for something other yeah. than, oh, she knew what it Yeah, she was up, she was <laughs> bloody loved it. <laughs> she so, was yes, so I think moving forward, I'll let's start striving for new goals in terms of... Um, the next challenge or the next exciting thing. Well, that keeps thing. people alive, though, doesn't Definitely. it? Like, you have to have things to, to, yeah. to look forward to and to strive for. But I would choose not to have a huge financial windfall, which a lot of people go, you're joking, aren't you? I go, no, because it's actually a pain in the butt. Yeah. You've got to decide. you got to manage the money then. You've got to figure out how you're 
Yeah, you can imagine. And, and those things we spoke about earlier is that you know, big financial wealth brings with it its own problems. It does. It does. How do people own. see you? Yeah. Are they are they judging you because of your financial success or your wealth? And they can affect your. Uh, yeah, that affect, of course that yeah. starts to affect your level of self esteem and you know in different ways. Sometimes yeah. it can be positive or negative. Yeah. So money is that's not necessarily evil because I think money is a great thing and that it can. Uh, as Gretchen Rubin says, it can buy happiness in certain ways. Yes, she talks about little mini splurges, like to get a little mini splurge. Yeah, you yeah. 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 spend your money on this, yeah. money can buy happiness, but not having money enough money to live it can definitely make you unhappy. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know. So, look, if our viewers want to find out more about the great work that you do, where should they go? www wellnesscoachingaustralia.com.au and they can find out all about your training and for anyone out there who wants to ever think about becoming a wellness coach I mean you couldn't learn from someone better than Fiona Cosgrove and she runs brilliant training programs for coaches so uh, I know it's definitely if I wasn't doing what I'm doing wellness coaching coaching would be something I would definitely be interested in fantastic in doing yeah maybe one day <laughs> Wealth so, and wellness coaching. Wealth and wellness coaching. There's an idea. We could collaborate on something, I think, later. <laughs> well, listen, thanks so much for being with me here, Fiona. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you to everyone for watching again for another week. And remember that you can catch me later on this week on iTunes on my Wealth Unplugged podcast, where I'll be talking about my key takeouts from my chat with Fiona today. So it's quick bite-sized chunks of what, what we talked about today. Remember also to tune in next week where I'm going to be talking to a girl called Natasha Moy from Girl Power Goddess. And we're going to be talking about why is it that women feel so embarrassed about admitting that they want to make squillions of money. See you then. <laughs>